Captain to the phone. I was strung out from the road. I was numb and I was tired from that long haul overload. Across the room, I saw a girl with eyes that burned like coal. She taunted me with electric smiles like lightning to my soul. Should have known. That she was making witchcraft. Should have known that she would steal my soul. She asked me for a dance, then she cast her temptress spell. Seductive moves and whispers like a siren sent from hell. She told me where the road was and she beckoned me to go. The body heat washed over me like a steaming lava flow. I should have known that she was making witchcraft. Should have known that she would steal my soul. Should have known that she was making witchcraft. A lure of her seduction made the devil's dark nights moan. Could not face the dawn In the early light of darkness I knew what she had done She stole my keys, my wallet And my semi-truck was gone She made me pay The steepest price for passion on the run I should have known that she was making witchcraft. I should have known that she would steal my soul. I should have known that she was making witchcraft. The lure of her seduction made the devil dark eyes. The views, opinions, and representations expressed on the Night Dreams Talk Radio Network and its website are those of the hosts, guests, and participants, and are not necessarily those of or endorsed by the network, its affiliated stations and broadcasts, the management, other hosts, or advertisers of the network. The show is found on the Night Dreams Talk Radio Network can, but do not necessarily, promote any particular lifestyle, belief, religion, political affiliation, or other personal practice. These shows are for entertainment purposes only, and are not intended to treat, diagnose, and or claim any cure of disease or condition, or give any medical or legal advice. You can advertise your business on Night Dreams Talk Radio, and you will be heard worldwide. 
why not contact us at nightdreamstalkradio at gmail.com. Stay safe, stay indoors, and listen to us. Coming to you from some far point station, like a cosmic tumbleweed, both north and south of the Pleiades, here's your host, Gary Anderson. Well, good evening or morning, depending on your time zone. I'm kind of blowing in tonight like a tumbleweed with no place to go. Just rolling down the road. Well, tonight we have a great show. We're going to be talking about, well, Twilight Zone. That was a major groundbreaking TV show. You know, if you really think about it, Voyage of the Bottom of the Sea, the original Star Trek, The Outer Limits, probably would have never happened if it wasn't for one man's envision, Rod Sterling. And we have his daughter on the show here tonight. She'll be on shortly. And we have a special guest also, which is going to, well, highlight a lot of things about, well, the original Twilight Zone. I hope everybody's had a great day today. Today is one of those days I felt like I should have stayed in bed, but I got up anyway. Well, you know what's interesting in the news? A new gene has been defect or detected on rabbits. Now, what the rabbits are doing, and James, you might want to jump into this. Jump, you get it? Rabbits jump. Rabbits are noted, you know, doing the bunny hop. But this new gene or defect is causing them not to do the bunny hop anymore. You know, gee, how many no. dance? Remember the bunny hop dance and all that? They're doing handstrings. They are. They're hand standing, walking all over the place. Also, those that species of rabbit has been known to have a lot of uh, issues with blindness too. But yeah, it's very odd. You imagine walking down the street and seeing a bunch of rabbits walking around on on their front paws with the rest of them sticking straight up and down. It's very very peculiar. I think I'd have to get my Walkman out or whatever the device it is and be playing some music, you know, for him because. I mean, doing handstrings. I, I, but that's not the only thing that's going weird. There was an article in one of the science journals yesterday. A virus is hitting brown bears. Uh-huh. And what is causing these brown bears to do is act like little, when they're little yet, you know, like a few weeks old, a couple months old. They're kind of, the, the mothers are like kicking them out. And, you know, instead of starving to death, they're going up to people and they're behaving like dogs. Now, but what's bad about this, this virus is affecting their brain is it eventually, and it doesn't take long, will cause them to basically die. They start losing all their muscle functions, their ability to move, uh, hold their head up. But before that happens, they, they... they're not scared of people. They'd rather be with people than other bears. Isn't it? And they, they've been yeah. noted as jumping into people's cars, trunks, walking into people's houses, not for beer like the other ones, but these are acting like, like little dogs for a while to it progresses. Yeah, that, that's strange. I tell you, I wouldn't know what to think about that. It's almost kind of makes you think that it's some kind of like a... Uh, Instead of mad cow disease, some kind of form of, well, mad puppy bear disease or something. But, it, yeah, it's definitely something going on there that's weird. Well, look at it. We got bunnies doing the handsprings, right? And now we got brown bears, baby brown bears, thinking that they're a toy poodle. I mean, something is weird going on. Yeah, nature's off. That's for sure. And you know what? got that magnetic field i'm sure that messes with them all the time too and like last night we mentioned the magma underneath ohio yeah guess what you know what maybe what you ought to do this summer is go buy you know a small swimming pool wading pool and you know on a cool night you can go into that nice hot tub because all that thermal activity under your front yard will probably heat it up and look when it gets cold you know you don't even probably have to turn on your furnace to warm up eventually because all that thermal lava underneath your going through Ohio might even warm up your house for you. <laughs> yeah, well, I like to use the old-fashioned way, you know, but uh, 
yeah, you got a good point. There. There's a lot. There's a lot going on. And I think it affects the animals also. Oh, it affects the something. It's affecting Earth climate changes. I tell you, I, again, I mentioned it the other night. I watched the old, uh, well, it's like 1980, Volcano. You know, where the volcano came out of the tar pits out of L.A. And, uh, you know, in a day's time, you know, it was going off and it would have destroyed all of L.A. Crazy. I'm surprised it didn't drop off into the ocean. Uh, as Dr. Richard Miller is predicting it's going to happen here one of these days. But I, I tell you, after watching that and then, you know, all the stuff that's going on, it's really opened my eyes up. Or should I just close my eyes and say it's all a bad dream? You know what? They're thinking uranium snowflakes could cause a nuclear explosion on dead stars. And that's why they think that these dead stars are blowing up. Wow. That's a whole lot to process. Can you imagine visiting a star and it's raining uranium snowflakes? That is bizarre. But yeah, listen, something bad's going to happen when it does that. Just think about it. I don't want to think about it. And did you know particles ejected from our sun does more to affect our climate than people even realize? And I'm not just even talking about solar radiation, but it has everything what's going on. And what's going on right now, the sun is going into a cycle that has never been recorded before. In other words, the sun is going out of control. And, you know, we're hearing about butt wiping paper all the time on the news. I think we need to realize Earth events, are, it's, everything, you know, is changing on a regular basis. But it's a lot of stuff going on right now, James. There is a lot of stuff going on, and those particles you mentioned, I think they act could act as a, a, a reflective kind of thing, and that's not good either, or either way of being cold or warm. But, yeah, there's a lot going on, and you're right. Yes, once, one big solar flare, flare like we had in the 1800s, and we would be pretty much turned into Amish by overnight. Oh, it could even be worse than that. That's the worst thing. I mean, but I don't worry about that. I'm not going to be Mr. Doomsday on the show. But no. you know, again, I was reading another article in one of the science journals today. I mean, since it came out yeah, yesterday, it's, it's hitting everywhere. You know, NASA is telling people, don't worry. We're not going to get hit by this doomsday asteroid for just under 100 years from now. Isn't that nice? Yeah, to, nice <laughs> in other words, I don't have to worry about it. I'm almost 70. I don't have to worry about it. But I and I don't have to worry about my grandkids, but I worry about my great grandkids. I mean, right? What what are they going to do? Exactly. You know what? Maybe by that time we'll we will uh, come up with something technolo technically uh, that we can help to deflect it or or help the situation. But I know as of now, I don't think we got much we can do. I think somebody needs to invent a real working time machine. And all we have to do is go back in time. You don't have to go back 100 years or 50 years or 25 years. Hey, when it comes time where that asteroid is going to hit, just go back five years. And then, you know, when it comes back close to that time again, just keep going back five years. <laughs> A perpetual uh, groundhog day, so to speak. With it. But, yeah, I see what you're, where you're going with that. Of course, on the other hand, if you're married, boy, Think about being in prison. <laughs> you know, if you keep going back in time, look at this, going back an extra five years, right? And if you did, right. if you kept doing that, right, are you going to age? Are you going to stop aging? In other words, if you're 50 years old, now you're 55, you go back five years. Are you now, are you still 55 or are you 50? I don't know, but you're giving me headaches thinking about it. <laughs> Well, don't worry <laughs> about it. I, my wife says I give her headaches every time I talk to her. You know what? We got two great guests. And, you know, I, I've been waiting for this show like you wouldn't believe. One of my favorite shows, because I'm hooked on sci-fi. I've always been hooked on sci-fi. And I'll tell you, Twilight Zone. Again, Lost in Space. All this stuff probably never would have existed could you imagine we would still be probably in cop shows or, or I hate to say it, Western shows, if it wasn't for Rod Sterling? Think about that one. 
Yeah, that's true. Or, or Western cop shows, but yeah, it's a good point. Or a combination of both. Anyway, I want to th- uh, welcome Mark and Anne on. How are you guys doing? Hello, doing great, how thanks. are you? I am doing good. Any day I can get up and I figure out where I put my wallet the night before, I realize I don't have Alzheimer's. I'm doing good. Right. Well, Mark, why don't you, you know, tell the little people a little bit about yourself and what you do, and then let's go on a little bit about, well, what you, what's your input about, well, the Twilight Zone, and then we'll bring Anne on, and we'll get all the down and low and all the interesting facts about her father and the Twilight Zone and some other things he did in broadcasting. Sure. Um, well, first off, uh, the shorthand for me is, is very short because I'm a writer. And uh, so everything I do is, uh, is hinged to that, is, is my interest in that. So, you know, any, and, and, and on my resume uh, of, uh, of the books I've written, are, uh, which is a deeply schizophrenic resume, because uh, there are books about Mark Twain, there are books about theater, there's books of TV history, but there's also a number of books which uh, are of, uh, uh, we'll say, will fall on the spooky side of the street. Uh, so uh, I wrote a book uh, a few years ago, which kind of combined two of those, the TV interests. I was a TV critic for more than 40 years. And so I observed an awful lot of TV history in that time. And I combined two of those interests by uh, writing a book called Everything I Need to Know I Learned in the Twilight Zone, which was my affectionate tribute, not only to the Twilight Zone, but to the career and the legacy of Rod Serling. So, um, uh, you know, you, it's, Gary, you had said that the, uh, you used a uh, term which is often applied to the Twilight Zone. You use the term science fiction. And I don't think there's any question that uh, science fiction fans uh, adore this show, and rightfully so. And I, I, it had a good, tremendous influence on science fiction, uh, basically because it immediately impacted the next big show that came on, which was Star Trek, because Gene Roddenberry went to school on what Rod Serling did in The Twilight Zone. However, The Twilight Zone is very difficult to pin down, and it's very difficult to define. Um, horror fans like it, but it's not really a horror show. There are episodes which, which which would certainly qualify as horror stories. It's not quite a science fiction show, although there are episodes which qualify as science fiction. It's not really a fantasy show. It's kind of all of the above and none of the above. The best way to describe The Twilight Zone is the way Rod Serling himself defined it in his introduction. Every week of The Twilight Zone, he would say, you are entering the realm of imagination. And he said it was as vast as space and as, as, it, 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 as vast as space. So just, just, just stop right there. <laughs> as vast as space. He's basically claiming everything. And that's what the Twilight Zone is. It encompassed the whole human condition, which is why those episodes are as resonant today as they were when they aired in the late 50s and early 60s, because this series goes right to the heart of the human condition and sometimes the inhuman condition. And it did it through imaginative storytelling and, more importantly, metaphoric storytelling, a storytelling which hid the moral or the message behind the fantasy so people would accept the story and listen to what was trying to be said. And that's kind of, you know, and Anne can talk a lot more about this, but this is really why the Twilight Zone is important in the whole arc of Rod Serling's career. Um, Rod Serling became a writer after uh, World War II. In fact, it was his World War II experiences in the South Pacific, which kind of pushed him towards writing, dealing with those war experiences. He went to uh, Antioch College here in Ohio, and he discovered writing, and he discovered that he could work through those war experiences through writing. And then he got 
involved with radio and TV stations, just as TV was coming of age as a medium. And he grew up as a writer at the same time that television grew up. And for most of the 50s, you see him getting stronger and stronger as a writer. You see him developing as a writer. And he's writing these wonderfully great uh, live television dramas for Kraft and Playhouse 90. And he's establishing a reputation as one of the, the, the great young writers in, in the television world. He and Patty Shayevsky are probably the two best known, most recognized names to come out of this period. But also during this period, television grew up. And in the early 1950s, there are kind of no rules. They were making it up as they went along. By the end of the 50s, it's become nothing but rules. And Rod Serling is having a tougher and tougher time getting the message across. He had a very strong social conscience. He wanted to write about important things. And he thought that the, the, the greatest of all American issues was bigotry, prejudice. And as we get closer and closer to 1960, television gets more and more nervous about that. So what does he do? He flees into the twilight zone. He creates a show, a fantasy show, where he can discuss whatever he wants. And he's banking on that, the fact that if he couches it all in fantasy, the sponsor won't care, the network won't care, the stations won't care, the viewers won't care, they will accept the message. And they will accept it willingly with this kind of very strong allegorical storytelling. And he's exactly right. And this is what Star Trek is going to do. And, you know, Twilight Zone goes off the air in 64. Star Trek starts in 66. And Gene Roddenberry was very open. He said, I learned how to do this by watching what Rod Serling did on the Twilight Zone. And, you know, I'll make one more point and then I'll shut up, which is the history of television is profoundly altered by the Twilight Zone and Rod Serling. But it's too timid it's too limiting to say that the twilight zone had this tremendous influence on science fiction and fantasy and horror and all of those shows the truth is the twilight zone has a tremendous impact on everything that's going to follow right on up to the great dramas of the last 20 years like the sopranos and mad men and breaking bad because all of the writer producers who created those shows credit rod serling with being the most influential writer on them, their hero. And that's because Rod Serling believed there was intelligent life on the other side of the television screen. And you didn't have to write down to them. You could write, you could write as high as you wanted. And he raised the IQ of television. He basically said you can do smart television and the boundaries are limitless. And these, his, these writers are his grandchildren and his great-grandchildren in some cases who have taken the medium and gone into all forms. There's not one part of quality television today that does not have Rod Serling's fingerprints on it. Oh, you're right. So that's how important it is. Well, you know, and also, didn't he help set up the industry standards for TV? Just by example. Just by example, I mean, you know, Rod was never an executive in the sense of calling the shots at, at the network or, or anything like that. He certainly called the shots within his own production company and, uh, and, and raised the standards that way. But, you know, if there was a famous, when the Twilight Zone was on the air, and in the early 1960s, the head of the Federal Communications Commission, uh, Newton B. Minow, famously gave his speech in which he proclaimed that television was a vast wasteland. And he mentioned that when television was good, it was better than anything else, but it was so rarely was striving to be good. And the one grand exception he made in that speech was the twilight zone. So I guess, yes, you could say he, he certainly set the standards for how good television would be. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, I again, every morning, guys, and, and you know, I have this habit where I live in Washington State, my cable company, at around 2 o'clock in the morning, they start running like two episodes of, you know, of uh, the Twilight Zone. And I, I, I purposely stay up to watch it. And even if I see the same one two weeks ago, it seems like every time I watch one of these episodes, I catch more and I get more information from it. And I, do you watch your father's shows at all? You know, the reruns? I do. I do. You know, and I, and in all honesty, frequently more to see him than the, than the actual show, but, um, Still watch them, yes. And and you're right. You know, I think you, you always get a different message. You get a deeper message with repetition. You, you do. And, you know, and sometimes you've watched it maybe dozens of times, and then all of a sudden your mind is more fresh for one time, and you realize what that whole episode was about, what it was reflecting about. I, I mean, I got to ask you a question. I How old were you? Uh, when well, I don't want you to give your age away, but I mean, were you very young when your father was doing the Twilight Zone? Yes, yes. Um, well, I'll, I'll be honest. I was four when when the Twilight Zone came out. I'm just so, wondering. Yeah. I'm, Go ahead. I'm, I'm just wondering how much stress because he didn't he do most of the writing of the episodes. I mean, he did have other writers come in, but didn't he write most of them in his? Handprint was a virtually on every episode. He wrote ninety-two of one hundred and fifty-six, um, but it was a seamless team of writers with uh, Richard Matheson and Charles Beaumont and Earl Hamner, uh, and you know they they had great contributions as well. Wow, I, I I'm just wondering how could anybody, and Mark, you can jump in on this. To write that many episodes, I mean, I could, you know, I just got done finishing a book that's getting published by a major publisher. It took me a long time to write the book. I could not even comprehend writing 93 episodes. Well, remember something else, too. He wasn't just the lead writer on the show. He was the executive producer. He was what we would have called today the showrunner the person making the day in day out decisions. He's running the writer's room. He's overseeing production. He's the host. He's the narrator. (laughs) He's on screen. He, you know, his contributions to the show are so immense. I mean, if if all he had done was write 92 episodes, that would have been an immense contribution. If he had never done one more thing, but remember this show is his vision. This show is, is his baby all the way through and uh he's 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 the face of it as well so uh it's not just that you know he's a th- th- this was a, a incredibly intense five seasons uh i don't know that there's ever been the like of it as far as uh, 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 uh somebody making that much of a contribution to a show and at the level of quality that he maintained throughout that. I just don't know that you'll find the equal of it in the history of television. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to slam the outer limits or shows like that, but I mean, the, the difference between the twilight zone, it drew you into it. it. It really sometimes even scared you, or if it didn't scare you, you thought quite a bit. What if that actually happened where I hate to say it, some of these other shows went kind of like silly. And and that's one thing that the Twilight Zone always stayed focused on. You know, like the one where the guy, I can't think of the actor, that was in the, the vault when the nuclear war went out. He loved reading books. God, I can't think of his name, and I know who he is. Mer- 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 Burgess Meredith. Yeah, yeah, Meredith. Uh, you know, he, he, he wore thick glasses. And, he you know, he didn't care that all the population was gone. He probably was relieved. Oh, God, now I don't have all these people to bother me. Now I can read. And he found the library. And he's all these books stacked up really high. He was so excited. He didn't think about food. He didn't think about shelter, water, water. But he thought about the books. And what happened? He dropped his glasses and broke it. I mean, that was such an epic classic right there. 
Well, it, it's a first season episode and it contains what is probably the most famous ironic payoff of the, the Twilight Zone. Irony always had a lot to do uh, with the stories in, in the Twilight Zone. And it also contains one of the great performances because it's Burgess Meredith. And it contains one of the great visual elements of the Twilight Zone, which is the broken glasses. Um, you know, where two or more are gathered and talk about the Twilight Zone, usually that episode comes up. <laughs> but, you, but, you know, Gary, you, you were asking before about, uh, you know, uh, Anne's experiences, you know, with the, you know when, when the show was originally on. You know, neither Anne or I were old enough to really watch the Twilight Zone in its original run. Uh, we did not experience it as that much in its original run because, you know, we, we were too young for it. You know, I experienced it in rerun. I experienced it when it started to go into syndication and it was endlessly rerun in the 60s. And uh, because, you know, I, 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 I too was like uh, four or five when it started, you know. And uh, it, 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 this is one of the things about The Twilight Zone is you can, be in, you can introduce it at any generation at any point. And, you know, you can't really say that about too many black and white shows from, you know, 60 years ago. You're right. Uh, this, this thing still has an immense kick to it. Um, and that's, that, that's one thing about, you know, that's, that, and that's all a testament to, uh, to, to Rod Serling. Cool. I mean, again, it's, it's, you just can't give him enough credit. And you know what? He did it at the perfect time, because I'll be honest with you. This is my input. Now, you guys can jump and yell at me for saying this. But I think if it would have been done in color, like the night gallery, I don't think it would have had quite the impact it had then or it still has now. Being done in black and white, for some reason, draws people into it more. Have you noticed that? Oh, I, I think that's very true. You know, using the shadows, and um, I, I agree with that 100%. Oh, yeah. What do you think, Mark? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I think uh, there are certain things that need to be in black and white, and I think the Twilight Zone is one. Um, and in some way, it, cert it doesn't age it. it. It just seems to be trapped in, in, in that, that, that look that, you know, whenever you think of the, the opening, uh, the Twilight Zone. You think of it as a black and white. When you think when people wear a Twilight Zone shirt, it's a black and white shirt. It's a black shirt usually with white lettering and the white stars on it. They even, you know, people don't even make fashion statements on the Twilight Zone that are in color <laughs> in black and white. Oh, yeah. So uh, I, I agree. I, I believe it, it is very much uh, a show which you know, if you if you splashed color on it, it would dilute uh, the the power of those those episodes. Now we need to do it. I got so excited here. I forgot about the break. My producer says break, break, break. So we'll be back in one minute with Anne and Mark, and we're going to talk more about her father, the Twilight Zone, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And if you're watching me on YouTube. You can certainly, if you have a couple questions, and I don't have my glasses on, so I have to squint because that particular monitor is away a ways. I will then try to relate some of the questions, a few of them, to our guests. So we'll be right back. You're listening to me, Gary, on Night Dreams Talk Radio Network. This is Night Dreams. We're here to make you feel Hi, Tom Davis here with Metatron Power and Light. We'd like to thank everyone for all the positive emails and responses to our music. Our music can be found on Amazon, Spotify, YouTube, and all digital outlets and is featured on Night Dreams Talk Radio with Gary Anderson. We recognize each other. Metatron Power and Light is a band that deals with esoteric subjects, the paranormal, and other topics that engage the spirit and mind. Visit MetatronPowerAndLight.com to learn more. We are facing a time of great change and the future is unwritten. But when we come together and seek answers, we expand our awareness until we begin to see the unseen. Uncovering secrets allows us to develop the knowledge we will need to shape our future and control our destiny. You're listening to Night Dreams Talk Radio. 
After Dark with our host, Gary Anderson. And we are back with Ann Sterling and with Mark. Uh, Here's the thing. What do you think TV would be like today? Seriously. Of all these shows that came afterwards, what do you think we'd be watching on TV if Rod never, well, came up with the Twilight Zone? That's a good question. <laughs> uh, I think it would be like a Twilight Zone episode. Uh, I think if you go back and you knock out certain shows, uh, you create a timeline uh, that is an alternate timeline, which leads probably to a more dismal path without that. Um, I mean, I, I, I think there were two shows on at the same time on CBS, and I think they both had an enormous impact on everything that was going to, 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 to follow. One was The Twilight Zone, and the other was The Dick Van Dyke Show. I think these two shows, uh, first off, they were both attempts to do intelligent adult uh, writing. They both had uh, showrunners who were the principal writers. In the case of The Dick Van Dyke Show, it was Carl Reiner. And in the case of The Twilight Zone, obviously, it was Rod Surley. And I think both of these shows coming on uh, almost at the same time, they overlap each other on the CBS schedule. I, I think both of these shows were attempts to raise the IQ of television, but they also established kind of the pattern of the writer who protected his writing by becoming the executive producer and the showrunner. That model really didn't exist until Rod Serling and Carl Reiner invented it uh, at that time. So I think you have these two shows, and if you look at comedy, everything sort of follows in smart comedy, follows the uh, the Dick Van Dyke show and everything in smart drama comes off of the Twilight Zone. So I, I think if you knock those two shows out of uh, the history of television, it's like hitting the supports on a, on a very big building. I think it collapses. And I, I don't think it's very, the, I don't think the landscape is very pretty. In fact, I think it looks like a, something out of the Twilight Zone at that point. Oh, I agree. Now, when he came up with it, and do you know how your father came up with the idea and how he presented it to the networks? I have this idea because it was new uh, coming out with a show like the twilight zone, you know, at that time, let's face it. What type of shows were, you know, they were CD detective type cop shows, you know, early generation ones and a ton of Westerns like Bonanza you know, want a dead alive, you know, all those type of shows. Here comes out now something totally different that the, the population wasn't prepared for. How, how did, do you know how he managed to get the executives at the networks or a network to, to pick this idea up and, and run with it? Right. Well, you know, it, it, as Mark said, my dad really wanted to write some, you know, serious topics. Um, about morality, et cetera, and he'd already been censored so much that he he finally realized, and this is his quote, that an alien could say what a Democrat or a Republican couldn't. <laughs> right. Um, so it, you know, it was a battle, but you know, he he still was able to get all these important messages through, and the sponsors didn't know what hit them. So they were probably in shock. I, I could, I could, I know, you know, we had Tony Dow on last week, you know, from Leave It to Beaver, Beaver's mm-hmm. older brother. And they were one of the very first shows to ever show a toilet. And they couldn't, they, that was the very first episode, but they couldn't show it because they had to convince the censors that, hey, it's a toilet bowl. And, you know, it was rather interesting finding about that. Again, you know, I could imagine. Now, Mark, maybe you can answer. The censors probably were all over Rod, you know, about all some of these episodes. They had to be. Actually, I think once, you know, the Twilight Zone was up and running and it was a bit of an autonomous shop, um, they didn't. I don't think they they had that much interference from the network. Uh, basically because the network didn't understand what they were doing. <laughs> it's, here they were doing episodes about uh, 
hatred and prejudice and war and, and ignorance and, and, and all of these themes and all the network saw was the fantasy. They thought, oh, they're doing nice uh, stories about somebody uh, who, who, who's going back to his, his, his childhood or he's doing this story about, uh, about this alien spacecraft landing. And that's all they saw. They didn't understand that behind that was a bigger message. So the answer is actually no. The shows that got all the interference, Gary, were the shows that dealt in re- what they thought was reality. For instance, right next door, we'll go right back to the, the Dick Van Dyke show. Rob and Laura couldn't be shown sleeping in the same bed. Well, they had I, to have Let's face it. I love, beds. I love Lucy, Donna Reed, Father Knows Best, none of them. I wonder how they ever had any children in TV land because everybody well, slept and, and, in a separate yeah. bed. <laughs> Remember, you couldn't show a pregnant woman on television back then. In, 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 in the context of a TV show, you could not. Show, there, there, there was, it wasn't actually until after the Twilight Zone left the air. Uh, they had a, it was actually laughing that made TV safe for pregnant women everywhere. Uh, Rowan and Martin's laughing had a, had a sketch on. And it was at the height of the anti-war movement. And they came up with a, a, a joke where a very pregnant Ruth Buzzy <laughs> is shown in a protest movement. And she's holding a sign that says, make war, not love. Well, the, the censor immediately got all over this, because she, not because of what she was saying, but because she was shown to be pregnant on the air. And uh, they said, well, we think it's a very funny joke. But uh, we think the sponsor will be upset. And they went to the sponsor. And the sponsor said, no, we think it's okay, too. So they finally, you know, <laughs> this was the kind of battle that, that a show like Laughing would have or a show like the Dick Van Dyke show would have. But it really didn't affect the Twilight Zone that much. There aren't really a lot of instances where you hear about them saying, no, no, you can't do that show or you can't do that. And now we look back and realize that the Twilight Zone was tackling some really, really heavy themes uh, in, in, what they, in what they were doing that Rod understood that you could play this for real. Uh, You're right. You, you know, I, I use this, Anne's heard this a lot, and, but I do a talk about Mark Twain and Rod Serling, and I call it Marvelous in Disguise <laughs> because both of them were exactly, that's a phrase that Mark Twain came up with to describe himself, but it's a perfect description of Rod Serling, was that he, Mark Twain said that he hid the moral in humor, that if you could get people laughing, you could tell them whatever you wanted to tell them about themselves. So he used humor and Rod used fantasy, but they were both using it as moralists. And The Twilight Zone is a deeply, deeply moral series oh, now, at I, the end of every. I, Go ahead. I'm going to say I, you just set yourself up on this one. The one I really can't imagine how it ever got past the censors on Twilight Zone. And, and you can jump into this guy. I'm sure you've seen it as many times as I have, where the, the, this guy, go, you know, goes into a monk or whatever you call it, you know, uh, uh, sanctuary. Monastery. Yeah, monastery. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, he's, you know, they didn't really want him in there, but they, they gave him a place to sleep. But he heard this yelling or screaming, like you know, like a wild animal, and and he wanted to investigate it. In fact, he did, and he saw this guy in there, and he, he's saying that they're holding me prisoner and all this stuff. And that was kind of a religious type of thing because you know what he turned out to be. He wasn't the guy next door. He was the devil. And I every time that, I. Yeah. Every time I watch that episode, I go, how did that ever get on the air when they won't show two beds? I mean, a single bed. Well, that episode was written by Charles Beaumont. It's called The Howling Man. And it does make an immense uh, comment about, you know, the devil being in yourself. Because the idea is that if you let the devil out, you know, he, he, what happens? He, he, he's imprisoned between the world wars. And that he was captured and put into this cell at the end of the First World War. And by letting this guy out, you, uh, the devil out, you are somewhat creating the conditions that are going to happen for the Second World War is what the story implies. So um, 
it, it is a very powerful story, but there's the metaphor. Actually, that story did get a little bit of trouble, but it's not what you think it is. It's not because they were showing the devil, and it's not because they were saying anything about it. But if you remember what was holding him in the cell was a simple staff with a crook at the end, and they called it the Staff of Truth. Well, in Charles Bowman's original script, that was a cross. The religious symbolism was a little bit, uh, it hit a little bit harder. And the network came back. They were a little uncomfortable about it being a cross. So they changed it to a staff and they called it the staff of truth. Um, but that's one of, that's an example of a little bit of minor censorship that they ran into. Oh yeah. That episode of all of them to me, that is probably the number one, uh, that I enjoy watching over and over again. And each time I watch it, I just go, wow, this is so heavy. Now, I'm going to add, talk about one more episode. Then I want to talk to Anne what it was like growing up in the household. Uh, the one to serve man. I hear about it because uh, I do a paranormal show. And we talk about ETs and aliens and abductions and time travel and all this stuff. And I get in trouble myself, okay? If I start saying, you know, ETs maybe might not be friendly, they might be here to go shopping at the farm. I, I mean, it, when you, you look at that episode, you know, the, the, they, they come down, they, they you go to the airport and see aircraft, you see all these UFOs, they're taking people on this trip to this beautiful planet. And that one scientist that was in charge of that group to interpret this book, you know, to serve man, He's going up on this craft. He's just about ready to go in. And this giant E.T. is standing there. And his assistant runs up really quick. Don't get on the craft. We deciphered the book. We broke the code. It's Serve Man is a cookbook. And I hear about that at least a couple times a month from people, guests, listeners. That has to be probably, I hate to say it, probably the most popular of all, and of all your dad's uh, shows on the Twilight Zone. At least it sticks in people's mind. Oh, I think that's absolutely true, and it was based on a short story written by someone else. Yeah, that's a short story. Yeah, I'm just wondering if ETs are actually doing that. But, Anne, what was it like? I know you were four years old, but growing up, what was it like in the Sterling family? Well, the, my dad, and I, and I wrote this in the book, you, you know, was the polar opposite of the image that you see walking across the MGM, um, you know, stage. My, my dad was funny. He was silly. He was childlike. He loved the Flintstones. Um, he did a the gorilla imitation that was the best gorilla imitation you can imagine in every home movie. There he is doing that. Did he? Okay, um, yeah. I gotta ask a question, Ann. Did he ever put a gorilla suit on? No. Okay. No, he didn't need it. <laughs> he didn't need it. He was so good. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, he he. There were many assets, obviously, to all of us. But you know, as Mark touched on, you know, my dad was a World War II vet, and like any vet, broken by the war, and t he actually originally had planned to go to college and wanted to be a phys ed teacher because he liked working with kids. But as he said, the war put an end to that. And he changed his major to language and literature because, as he said, he, he had to get it out of his gut. Um, he had to write it out. And I, and I vividly remember my dad having nightmares. And when I would ask him in the morning what happened, he said he was dreaming about the war and the enemy coming at him. What did your dad, what did your father do during the war? Uh, he, he was a paratrooper. So he got really into the thick of it. He was in Leyte, where, um, where apparently some of the fiercest writing or uh, fighting was. Oh, wow. And yeah. so he, he, you know, I know from my military background, I still have nightmares occasionally. I mean, so he was still having nightmares long after, you know, his service to the country. 
Oh, absolutely. You know, they didn't, uh, PTSD wasn't a term then. I think it was called shell shock or something. And, but there was no treatment. And, you know, I, I, I have a friend whose father, uh, was also in the war, actually saved by a German soldier, um, who amputated his leg. And, um, he would, my father, or my friend's father was Jewish, and the doctor took his, um, star off so that, uh, they, they wouldn't know he was Jewish. But it wasn't until her dad was in his 80s that he even began to talk about the war. So it's, you know, it's just so traumatizing for, for anyone. Well, you know, in one of the episodes of The Twilight Zone, wasn't it, um, the girl who played um, on Bewitch, uh, and I'm trying, Elizabeth Montgomery. Yeah, and I can't remember the other guy. Um, it was Charles Bronson. Charles Bronson. Yeah, I should remember that. It, 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 wasn't he just basically starting in acting at that point too, like a few years into it? Mm-hmm. And, and that is another one that sticks with you in in your mind. And do you ever think maybe that was maybe from his war experiences? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the Purple Testament, absolutely. You know, I, my dad, like many, find writing cathartic. And certainly he was writing out, as he said, you know, all this trauma and grief. And I mean, yeah. So, I mean, growing up, I mean, what was it? I, I don't know when your father passed. I don't know how old you were when he passed, but again, going to school with friends, everybody knew who your father was. What was it like for you as the individual growing up? Well, I, you know, I, I knew that my father was a writer. I knew that from a very early age, but I didn't know exactly what he was writing. And I wrote about this in the book, too, I, um, until I was about seven years old and a kid on the playground <clears throat> asked me one day, if I was something out of the twilight zone <laughs> and I had no idea what that meant. And so I went home and asked my father and he explained that he wrote a show and it was a little too old for me. And, uh, I, I think we were watching an episode of the Flintstones at that time and, uh, the commercial ended and that <laughs> Wilma came back on and that was all I needed to know. But, uh, <laughs> so he was really hooked I, on the Flintstones, right? Oh yeah, yeah, and Augie Doggy, and yeah. I mean that—that's what I mean. You know, he was so different than that image that you know that tight-lipped image, and that that people think. And uh, my dad came to see me when I I went to a boarding school for two years, and my dad came to see me and was taking my friend and I out to dinner, and my friend was really nervous because she thought that you know he'd be this dark, scary guy, and. <laughs> You know, you know, within five minutes, my dad made her feel comfortable and my friends adored him. He was like, you know, having a playmate, you know, even as a teenager, I loved to be around my father. He was just so funny. My mother used to tell me, stop laughing at him. You're only encouraging him, you know, because he was silly. Oh. But my dad died in 19, you ask when he died, he died in 75 and I had just turned 20 three weeks before he died. He had had uh, three heart attacks, and he died during open heart surgery, which you know back then was a very different procedure. And we, but still, you know, we were, you know, fearful. But n- no one thought he wouldn't make it. I mean, that just was not a possibility. And my dad was very much looking forward to. Um, he wanted to write a Broadway play. He wanted to write a novel. Um, so it was it was shocking and. Um, paralyzing to lose him. And to this day, you know, not a day goes by that I'm not thinking about him. I, I, yeah, it's hard. You know, I, I lost two sons here like seven months ago and, and he just said something time doesn't erase. It's always going to be with you. But didn't I, every time I ever saw your dad introducing, you know, like especially on the twilight zone, introducing the episode, he always had a cigarette in his hand. Did he smoke a lot? Oh, well, first, I just want to say I'm so sorry about your sons. Um, 
But yeah, my, my dad could not quit smoking, and his father was a smoker. And uh, actually, on the way to the hospital, he convinced the ambulance he had to go to Rod. The ambulance took him from the hospital here to Rochester for the surgery, and he convinced the ambulance drivers to stop so that he could have a cigarette. <laughs> and because there was oxygen in the ambulance, they all had to get out and smoke on the side of the road. It was like an SNL skit. Um, but yeah, he couldn't. He couldn't give it up. Even after he died, we found cigarettes hidden be- behind his filing cabinet, and. Uh, you know, I remember him before he went to Rochester when we were at the cottage and um, he would take walks and he was sneaking cigarettes, but he tried very hard to quit. I don't know. I, you know, I, when I met my wife and this is not about me, but when I met my wife, like 40 some years ago, I smoked two packs of cigarettes a day and I really loved my wife. But she said, if you want to marry me, you have to quit smoking. And I said, okay, I will wing it down. No, if you want to marry me, you stop now. And I think in the last 46 years, I've smoked five cigarettes. And and that was the hardest thing I ever had to do, was to quit smoking. Yeah, it's tough. And those five cigarettes, (laughs) I snuck them. I snuck them. My wife never knew it. But now she does. Yeah, (laughs) Gary. Yes, Mark. <laughs> Gary, I, I, I'll jump in here just for a second because the name of Ann's book is As I Knew Him, My Dad, Rod Serling. And I just cannot recommend this book enough to, uh, to anybody uh, who is interested not only in Rod Serling, but in uh, how the, the, the concept of grief and how you cope with grief and uh, the, the, the journey, that, which is uh, an individual journey for everybody. Um, and we all go through it. We all have to go through it. Uh, it's one of the, the, the great cruel things of life that, you know, the, the more you love, the more you're going to pay for it by having to go through grief. And Anne's book is, uh, not only a, a, a marvelous, uh, exploration of that territory, uh, but also it is a wonderful portrait of her dad. Most of us, you know, did not get the the the, uh, the, the opportunity to meet Rod Serling, the real Rod Serling, the one that Anne's talking about, the, the guy with a sense of humor, the guy who liked imitated gorilla, the guy who was uh, just a bundle of warmth and charm, and not the guy on the the screen, that sort of forbidding presence in the suit with the cigarette, with talking in the clip tones and. He didn't even talk that way uh, <laughs> when he was off camera. That was a, 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 an affected way of speaking that he adopted on the camera. So the only way you're ever going to get to meet Rod Serling, the real Rod Serling, is by reading Anne's book. And it brings her dad to life. You know, for a book that's about grief, it brings her dad to life in a way that is so three-dimensional and, 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 and wonderful. That I just, again, I cannot recommend this book enough. Well, you know, you didn't give me a chance to ask all that with her, you guys. A- a- and I'm glad you brought it up. But I know I only had you scheduled for an hour. Can you guys hang in for another half an hour? Is it possible? Um, and I could do about 15 minutes, but I just want to uh, also mention Mark's book, Everything I Need to Know I Learned in the Twilight Zone. And I, I would love Mark to tell the story about Becky, his okay. daughter. And- well, let's do this break real quick. We'll come on and we'll hang on with you guys for another 15 minutes. We'll talk about that. Uh, I, I do when we come back. And I just want to ask you, gee, you know, I wish I would have had a father who would have sat down and watched the Twilight, not the Twilight Zone, but, you know, like the Flintstones and stuff like that. I mean, that is awesome because most people thought your dad was kind of callous. And here we're finding out, come on, this the, the perfect father. Anyway, we'll be back with Anne and Mark right after this. You're listening to me, I think, on Night Dream Stock Radio. We'll be right back. From the compound in beautiful Big Harbor, Washington, Night Dreams Talk Radio presents your host, Gary Anderson. 
And that is me. We're here with Mark and Anne. We're talking about her father and all that. Mark, the book you wrote. Let's talk about that for a minute. Then we'll go back a couple of questions about Night Gallery with Anne. And then, you know, we can all sit back and watch a rerun of The Twilight Zone afterwards. How's that? Never a bad way to spend an evening. Oh, never. I got the popcorn and I got my soda. I'm all set for two o'clock this morning. Go ahead, uh, Mark. Tell me about your book. Well, my book came about uh, basically because Twilight Zone is my favorite TV show of all time. And I'd written a couple of, of other TV histories. I'd written a book on Columbo, as you know, Gary. And I'd written a book on uh, the Night Stalker, the, the Kolshak series. And um, uh, but I always wanted to write a book about the Twilight Zone, and I, I, I there been so there had been several books on the Twilight Zone, uh, uh, documenting its history, its development, uh, you know, and, and very good ones. I'm, I'm a great admirer of uh, some of those books. But um, when my daughter Becky turned 15, um, she'd already seen Night Gallery. You mentioned Night Gallery, the later series, which was the horror series. And Becky had already seen uh, Night Gallery, and she'd seen a lot of classic television. She, 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 she loved classic television, so she'd seen a lot of the Andy Griffith show and uh, uh, shows like that, the Dick Van Dyke show and I Love Lucy. So when she turned 15, I, I sort of turned to her and said, you know, you, you have completed your undergraduate degree in classic television. It's time for you to start your graduate degree. <laughs> and it's time you enter the Twilight Zone. So we decided to watch all 156 episodes of them in order. We did a forced march through all 156 episodes. And we were in like the third or fourth episode of the first season. And it's the one uh, called Escape Clause with David Wayne as uh, the hypochondriac Walter Bedecker, who wants immortality. And uh, of course, the devil appears and offers him a contract and any fan of the Twilight Zone knows if you sign that contract, it is not going to end well. Um, but, you know, he signs it, and we ultimately know the devil is going to win. And when the episode was over, I, I jokingly turned to Becky and, and wagged a finger at her and said, you let that be a lesson to you. You always read contracts. You always read every clause, and I could never sign anything if you don't know what you're signing. And, you know, I was joking, and we laughed. And then I thought for a second, and I said, wait a minute, you know, the thing of all these people got in trouble during the mortgage crisis by signing contracts and they didn't know what they were signing. And I said, you know, I'm kind of serious about this. Um, this is actually true. <laughs> and, and so we kept watching episodes and after each episode, I'd say, let that be a lesson to you. And after a couple of weeks of this, the penny finally dropped. And I said, well, this is your twilight zone book. You let that be a lesson to you. That's what these are. These are morality tales. These are parables. Each and every one ends with an unsaid line that was said in all of Aesop's fables, which was, and the moral of the story is dot, dot, dot. So I said, all I need to do is extract what's already here. And so my book is a look at 50 life lessons that are uh, extracted from various episodes of the twilight zone and it's a very conversational book it's a very essay style book but it all came about because of sharing that book with my daughter and after the book was published i was doing a book talk and somebody said to me came up to me and said oh, I, I love your book and one of the things i love most is the whole father daughter thing that goes on in the book and i said what are you talking about and they said, well, the whole book begins with, begins with, 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 with the, 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 the daughter and ends with the father. I, I, I really didn't understand what they meant. Sometimes when you write a book, it takes somebody to come up to you and tell you what you did. And in this case, I, I said, I said, I said wait, wait, you've got to explain this. And they said, well, literally the first piece of writing in the book is by Ann Serling. She wrote the foreword to the book. The last piece of writing is a piece of writing by Rod Serling. So it begins with the daughter and it ends with the father. The book begins with the daughter because you shared the show with your daughter. And it ends with you because you wrote the book. And 
it begins <laughs> with you. Your name is on the cover. The last thing in the book is the author's photo, and your daughter, who is a very talented photographer, took it. So it begins with the fall. And I, I literally didn't get, I mean, I, I was, I was astonished <laughs> by everything this person was saying. And I got, I couldn't deny any of it, you know? So it, 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 sometimes it does take somebody else to tell you, you know, don't you understand what you did? Because <laughs> you're doing this subconsciously, you know, you're doing this, it's coming from a real place. It's going to grow a part of who you are. So naturally it's going to come out on the printed page. But it still takes somebody to to come back and say, this is what happened. Very well put and very interesting. Now, Anne, did your father ever realize before he passed on what he created with the Twilight Zone, what he changed the whole world in TV? Did did it ever sink into him? Absolutely not. And, And no one would have been more done than my dad that we're still talking about him. Um, he, he once said that um, he just hoped that people remembered that he was a writer. Uh, no one's going to forget your dad. Now, the, the, other thing, the other thing that he said to a writing class was what he wanted on his grave was just something that said he left friends. And when I, it took me a very long time to be able to go to my dad's grave, but when I finally went, there was a piece of masking tape tied to a flag there, and on it it said he left friends. So he not only would have been stunned that people are remembering him as a great writer, but, um, you know, people that knew him and, and are, are still miss him terribly, of course, his family. Um, I was going to say something else and it fell out of my head, but, um, yeah, he, he would be stunned that, that we're still having these conversations, but of course, you know, he wrote about issues that are still so relevant and prevalent today, you know, racism and, um, uh, you know, mob mentality, scapegoating, there, there's a program in Binghamton where all the fifth graders watch the Twilight Zone and they learn about all these things, um, isolation and all the things I just mentioned. And I think my dad would have just been so thrilled with this program that, you know, kids are learning about this and it would have had a profound effect on him for sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, now he did Night Gallery, but with Night Gallery, I heard he only wrote a a few episodes for it. How did did your mom or anybody ever relate to you how he felt from doing the Twilight Zone where he wrote 90 some episodes going to Night Gallery and basically being the host? Did he feel like that was an insult ever? Well, he had um, he was very hopeful, you know, when the Night Gallery was coming out. But but unlike the Twilight Zone and, and what you and Mark were talking about before, you know, he he was the showrunner on The Twilight Zone. He had creative control. He did not have creative control on The Night Gallery. And he, you know, soon realized that to be the grave error that it was. But that said, um, many think that some of his finest uh, writing were, were some of the Night Gallery episodes. They're tearing down Tim Riley's bar, for in- instance, is a beautiful script very much like Walking Distance, the episode, the Twilight Zone episode. Um, How about that haunted car and Khrushchev buying it? Oh, you, the, you, uh, the, the, the Twilight Zone episode, you mean? The, uh, right. I'm, the, the awful, yes, the, the Jack Carson episode. It, <laughs> As I, yeah, I thought we were still in Night Gallery there for a second. I was, it took me a second. I'm sorry. Though, so, it just yeah, came in my, <laughs> my, my little brain. It, it hit me. That's okay. That, that, Really, because here we were at the middle of the Cold War, right? We never knew if we we're going to be in a nuclear exchange with the Soviet Union at that time. And here's Khrushchev, right? And this salesman suckers him into buying this haunted car. Couldn't have gone to a better person. The uh, you know, and and the, the that whole era of the Red Scare and the McCarthyism and all that that informs an awful lot of Twilight Zone episodes. But amazingly, not in a way that dates them, because, again, 
Rod had a way of writing about ways that are that's eternal. Like most great writers, like Shakespeare and Dickens and Twain, he he had, he was such a great observer of the human of human nature, and human nature doesn't change. Sometimes that's a very sad thing to say, but uh, he was such a great and keen observer of human nature that even though he might have been writing about that period, and, and there's no more powerful example of that than a an episode, first season episode he wrote called The Monsters Are Doing Maple Street, which is about, you know, a, a, a perfect suburban neighborhood. Uh, there is a, a meteor or something which flies overhead and all of a sudden nothing works on Maple Street. Nothing. The cars won't start. The radios won't work. The telephones don't work. The lights won't go on. And uh, the neighbors are plunged into suspicion and fear of each other when one by one, somebody's car starts or somebody's lights go on. Why did his lights go on? Were they aliens or somebody among us aliens? Are there monsters among us? And of course, the, you know, <laughs> Rod is writing about the McCarthyism and the red scare about people being paranoid about who was a communist and how fear and suspicion can drive us apart. And that episode is more relevant today than when the day it aired. And and Anne has a wonderful story about that that program she was talking to in Binghamton. And it, it, tell Gary about the monsters are doing Maple Street. Please do being used in the class. Yeah, please do. Yeah, one one of the teachers um, in in the uh, fifth dimension program showed that episode, and she asked the class, "So who are the monsters?" And she said the entire class stood up. <laughs> They got it. <laughs> they understood. We are the monsters. <laughs> we are, and and I just and I think that's such a great story. And it's and 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 these are fifth graders. We're not, you know, they get it. They understand the the power of the the parable, the power of the metaphor. Oh yeah, and the notion of that story, which says to us, "Divided we fall." Lincoln was right. Uh, a house divided is against itself cannot stand. And if we do not find a way to, to to talk to each other, to communicate with each other, to support each other, we just aren't going to make it. We're not going to make it as a country. We're not going to make it as a society. We're not going to make it as a world if we, you know, if, if we don't find a way to solve these eternal problems, which which plague us. And that's what Rod Serling was often reminding us of. Oh, yeah. Now, I got because we only got Anne for a minute. And Mark, can you hang afterwards to the bottom of the hour? Yeah, possibly? sure. I, I, I can I, I can hang on for a while. OK, great. And I heard for the grapevine because I got friends in Hollywood that when your father passed on, you found a whole bunch of screenplays and stuff that, you know, never, uh, you know, like in the garage or something or what. I Yeah. It, w can you clarify anything about that? Yeah, there, there was an episode that my mother found that, um, and I'm, I can't think of the name of it. It was a remake of one of them. It was, the remake was really bizarre. Um, Mark would probably know. Um, you could ask him that. Well, Mark, do you know? I, I'm, I'm, and I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, is this the one that became the Lost Episodes TV movie? Is, is yeah, that what um, we were referring yes, to and uh, Judy Collins was in it actually. Oh well, that was that that, that we write. Um, <laughs> now I'm blanking out on the title. Isn't that bad? And I even attended the press conference for that. I, I even interviewed Judy Collins about that. And uh, yeah, it, because and they I, they moved think, the setting to like a futuristic setting or something. Right. I think was it Ron um, Perlman was in it as well. And I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. But yeah. It was. Yeah. 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 Very strange. Uh -huh, yeah. So what, that, was I'm, it a, a, sorry, a remake of A Town Has Turned to Dust? The only story I know. <laughs> Interesting. Now, but, uh, yeah, because I, I don't want to keep her past her, her limit here. Uh, Anne, t uh, tell us where we can find this great book about your father. And before that, how long did it take you to write this book? Well, you were talking about uh, that before, how long it took you. I. I had actually, when my dad died, because I find writing cathartic, and, I, and as I told you, I was paralyzed with grief, I had tried to start a book then um, called In His Absence, 
And because I really had not even begun to know how to grieve, to navigate that minefield, I, I couldn't finish that book. So I started this one, and it took me probably seven years of writing. So it was, and it, and the book originally came out in two thir- um, 2013, and I've just completed a new edition um, that has um, some new stories, new photos, and, um, new commentary, which should be out in April, and Great. it will be available on Amazon. Well, will you let us know when it it comes out, and you know we will let people know because again, of all the writers out there and, and I, and TV shows, I, I have to be honest with you, Alfred Hitchcock presents or whatever. Okay. The twilight zone was like the cream of the crop. I remember my dad had to be home on time, no matter what to watch the twilight zone. And you know what? I couldn't watch stuff like I spy when it originally came on because they thought it was too bad. But you know what? I was younger yet, and I was able to sit down with my dad and, well, maybe, you know, bond by watching The Twilight Zone. So, I, you know, I, again, I want to thank you for coming on. I want to thank you for your dad for serving our country and the service to our country. It, it means a lot. And I tell you what. Your dad is not going to be forgotten oh, ever. Thank you, thank you so much. And and in closing, I just I really want to recommend Mark's book too. And and there's also another book, um, Night Gallery: The Art of Darkness. Um, the, the Night Gallery fans, uh, I think, would like with the paintings, and um, it's, it's quite a nice book. But thank you for having me. I I always love talking about my dad. Um, and I'll always love having time with Mark, too. You're here. Well, thank you, Anne, so much for coming on Night Dreams. Okay. I really appreciate have it. A nice night. Thank okay. you. Okay, you Bye-bye. take care, kid. Okay. Bye-bye. Well, again, uh, what are you doing now? Uh, you know, writing. You got any new books or projects you're working on? Oh, yes. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I am in the teeth of writing a biography of Edgar Allan Poe. Um, and this book needs to be done uh, by October. I delivered the manuscript in October to St. Martin's Press, and it'll be published uh, a year later, October 2022. And uh, so I, th- this is the book I am currently up to my neck in right now in uh, writing and researching. So uh, this is a uh, this is quite an undertaking. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, there's been so much written about Poe, and uh, so they've sort of come up with something which is fresh, and a sort of some a new angle on him. I think is, but but I think Poe is, but you know Poe and Serling have some something in common. I mean, besides the fact that they both have you know sort of supernatural spooky stuff on their resume, uh, I think one of the things that they have in common is. Um, the very thing that has kept them alive which is their public image. You know, we think of Poe as this kind of gloomy guy who dressed in black with a raven perched on his shoulder, you know, sort of a, a, a wild eyed guy up in the attic, penning these fever dream stories. And, you know, and, and, and that's the image of Poe we put on T-shirts and that's the image of Poe we present in the pop culture. And that master of the macabre uh, guy, and that has kept him alive uh, sort of throughout the, the decades when other writers have come and gone. And, you know, the same thing with Rudd. We, we think of Rudd as the master of the Twilight Zone, that guy, or a night gallery, the guy who is always the sort of uh, guide to, to a spooky experience. And with both of them, that's a, it, it is part of who they are, and it's an important part of who they are. But it, that's it. It's only a part. You're only seeing like the little tip of the iceberg that's showing. And there is this vast amount of person behind that. And, you know, in the case of Poe, this is a very careful writer. He was a very careful craftsman. This is a guy who was constantly revising his work, constantly looking for the right word. He was a, he was a consummate professional uh, as a writer. Uh, and, and, and he was a writer who liked to write about a lot of different things. 
Yes, the horror stories are important, but this man also invented the detective story. He invented the model that became Sherlock Holmes and all of these detectives that were to follow. He was a leading critic of his time. He, a lot of what he wrote was humor. Now, nobody thinks of Edgar Allan Poe humorous. But like Rod Serling, he was a very funny, witty guy. And, you know, so kind of knocking the, getting behind the stereotype, getting behind the mythology, which can keep us from seeing the complete artist. When all you see is the image, when all you see is the Rod Serling who is in front of the Twilight Zone or the Edgar Allan Poe who is on the T-shirt, you're not really seeing the real artist who, who created all of that stuff. And he needed, you need all the other stuff uh, in order to create. Uh, there, I don't know of any horror writer I have ever known or interviewed who didn't have a great sense of humor. Actually, you and know, you need I, a good sense of humor to write horror because you'd go crazy if you didn't have a good. Sense. You're right. I know a couple yeah. authors that write horror, you know, scripts. For guys. Out, and you know what? <laughs> if you if you sat and talked to them, you think, hey, yeah. they're a comic or something, you know. And then you sit there and talk to them, you, you, and what do you write? Comedy? No, I write. People's getting their heads tore off and cutting ham with a chainsaw. And I go, oh, my, how do you come? It's like they're two different type of people, just like Rod Sterling. Everybody thought he was cold and callous. And when, you know, we just found out he imitated a what? A monkey? A gorilla. A a gorilla, right? He watched the Flintstones and (laughs) and all the completely different. A perfect father with kids. I mean, it's just wow, you know. Now, well, that, that's it, and 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 that person almost has to be there. You know, I, I once uh, I got to, to know uh, Robert Block, who wrote Psycho, so you know, invented Norman Bates and invented that 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 kind of whole genre. And he was a great horror writer. Oh, yeah. He wrote a lot, but he was also a very deeply funny guy. <laughs> uh, this was a guy who 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 titled his own autobiography. Once Around the Block, an unauthorized autobiography. So right there, you know, this is a guy with a good sense of humor. And and Block was very, very funny. And he pointed out to me that, uh, you know, horror writers are f- not just funny people. They tend to be funny off stage, which, you know, comedians don't tend to be. Comedians no, only tend opposite. to be funny when they're on. But horror writers are kind of funny just to talk to, like you said. And, uh, you know, I, I, that's something that I, I have noticed in almost every single horror writer I have, and I've known a lot of them. Um, and, and, you know, from Stephen King on down, they all have a very solid, well-grounded sense of humor. Okay. And they also write things cathartically. You know, Stephen King said, we work through our nightmares. We work through our nightmares on the printed page, and then we give them to you. We're done with them. It's your problem now to deal with these things. But, you know, so, I, I was going to say, back in the, how was it, uh, late 90s, uh, maybe early, yeah, I think it was late 90s, I met him. They were making a movie up here in uh well, Lakewood, Washington, I believe. You know, one of the horror movies of a house with ghosts and all that stuff. And at that time, I took a break out of broadcasting and I was managing a professional camera store chain. And, you know, one of his gophers would always come in, you know, getting miscellaneous stuff. And all of a sudden, he came in with Stephen King. And he was there, whatever he was doing for the movie. Uh, and I started talking to him. And I would think this guy would be, you know, uh, very serious, but he wasn't. I mean, I talked to him for like 10 minutes, and (laughs) after he left, I was still laughing. Yep, that great. I've I've interviewed King four or five times. My last book was uh, uh, about, it was a history of the Shawshank Redemption. So uh, my last book was a deep dive look at uh, a film based on one of Stephen King's best known and best loved films. And, you know, I did a, a long interview with, with him on the Shawshank Redemption. But every time I've encountered King, um, he's a great guy. He's a guy you just want to sit down and have a conversation with and, and share some laughs with. And, uh, you know, he's, 
that that has been true. And by the way, it's not just horror writers. I found that's true of horror directors and and actors as well. You know, they always say that Boris Karloff loved to read stories to children, and you know, all these guys were just really great guys. You know, um, and I think that's because there, there is this kind of cathartic. You're dealing with with this stuff. You're working through this stuff. It's you know what Anne was talking about with her dad and the World War II experiences. Um, and him discover writing as a way of cathartically dealing with it. Uh, Eugene O'Neill used to have a phrase, uh, writing himself sane. You know, anybody who was talking about all the trauma that he went through with his family and things like this, writing was a way of getting to the other side of it, was the, uh, was the way of coping and working your way through those emotions. Uh, O'Neill also once said that he didn't take vacations because he was a writer. He didn't need to take vacations. Writing was bad for oh, him, yeah. and I think that that's that's you know can be almost particularly true of people who write about horrific things. Uh, you know, they 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 dealing with with the biggest of big themes. Uh, you you know, people who write horror, you know, you're dealing with life, death, the presence of evil, uh, possibility of, of of redemption of. of you know, all of these, things, these are big, big things. <laughs> these aren't, you know, we're not writing about some, you know, middle-aged college professor's midlife crisis. Here. <laughs> we're talking about, you know, big, big things. And, you know, hard tends to do that. I think that's, you know, the Twilight Zone uh, really went after big, big ideas and big things. And I think that's one of the reasons it still has resonance today is it's not like those themes get smaller with as the generations go on they're just as big as they were oh, in they, 1959 or 1960 and you're right like gene roddenberry okay here he you know he he leaves the police department after i guess getting shot you know he comes up with ideas he comes up with star trek the same thing when he wrote the episodes a lot of the you know episodes of star trek he tried to make a point of society what is going on and that's the same thing that Rod Sterling did. And, you know, and if it wasn't for Rod Sterling, I don't think we would have had, like I said earlier, Star Trek would have probably never existed. Now, I'm, you know, I'm going to have to let you go in a minute. But again, the last mm -hmm. time we were, you, you're on, you, I still get people emailing me wanting to talk more about Columbo. I mean, when you were <laughs> on, I mean, we talked about Columbo, I think, twice. People are so still infatuated with Columbo, Peter Falk. It, it, you know, I, I never cease to be amazed. I really, I, I, I every day, you know, I get a, a message on Facebook or something, and it, it, it is it is Columbo of some kind. The en enduring appeal of that character <laughs> and Peter's performance, I, it's just you, you. There's no no getting around it. Uh, um, I guess I fell in love with it too, and you know that's why you, you don't write an entire book about a character unless you're 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 you're, you're really enamored of it. And uh, but you know I thought after all these years, you know, but I've been so you know thrilled just to see just how much deep resonance the, there is with that character and how much people still feel bonded to that character. And a number of people have written me to say that over the last year that um, Columbo and my book has been getting them through the pandemic. You know, they, they've written like, you know, this has been my guide. I watch a Columbo every night and I, and I, and I get your book out. And these are my companions as I go through this. You know, you don't get much higher compliments as a writer than that. No, and you know yeah, what? There's not, there's not, there's not a lot that is going to compare to that. If somebody says, you know, this is what got me through the last year. And I want to thank you for writing this book. You know, there's no way to not to be incredibly humbled by something like that. Well, you, uh, by somebody saying that. And you got to real chance to get to know the real Peter Bach, you know, getting like a phone call one or two o'clock in the morning. By the <laughs> way, I think I hear in the background, Peter Fox saying something. Mm -hmm. Do you hear Peter Fox saying something to the listeners? I hear, I hear Peter all the time. Are you kidding? I turn around, I hear Peter's voice in my head all the time. Yeah, Mark, did we ever do a show where the psychiatrist was the killer? I can, you know, I hear Peter's voice right there. <laughs> oh, I just did too. Uh, 
<laughs> well, you know what? I so, hate to say this. Maybe in a couple months again, we need to do another refresh of, I hate to say it, Columbo. One more thing. Yeah, yeah one more one, thing. Wait, yes. wait, 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 just one more thing. Yeah. It's yeah. always one. Yeah. You notice that. There's always one more thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Ten minutes later, and, uh, one more thing. <laughs> you know, and, and Anne's gone, but I need I need to tell you this. You know, there is a Rod Serling, Peter Falk connection. Well, tell us real um, quick. Well, among one of the things is that um, I got to share this with Anne. Because although I never met her, her dad, I did obviously uh, get, got to know Peter very well. And one of the people Peter uh, admired so much was Rod Serling. And he did a Twilight Zone episode. He's, in, he's not a very good one. It's not really a better Twilight Zone. He plays a, a Fidel Castro type character oh, yeah. I remember in that. an episode called The Mirror. And uh, yeah, the metaphor is a little blatant. And it's not one of Peter's best performances. But he did do a Twilight Zone that Rod wrote. And then later on, he did a movie remake of uh, of a TV movie that, that Rod had written called uh, A Storm in Summer. Uh, and the original had starred Peter Ustinov. And then they did a remake for Cable uh, with, with Peter Falk uh, in, in the lead. So, so Peter did do, but Anne has always said, and I agree with her, that, that certain angles... Peter Falk looked a lot like her dad. When you look at Peter in certain roles, and I mean they were they were about the same height, you know, they're both Jewish, about the same height, wore the hair in the same way, had that kind of black curl type of thing. And when Peter held himself in just a certain way, he he would have he would have made a dynamite Rod Serling if they'd ever done his life story oh yeah <laughs> because he, he he did have a tremendous sometimes resemblance to to her and that was pointed out to me not by anybody else but ann ann noticed the she had what she'd been watching a movie that peter was in after her dad died and he he turned his head in a certain way and she about gasped because he looked so much like her dad so oh, yeah. uh, I could see that they were both from upstate New York. They were both both products of upstate New York. Uh, so you know, they, uh, <laughs> they there were some things in common there. I, I got to ask you one real question, quick question or two before I let you go. Is it actually true that one time Peter Falk pulled his eye out and uh, to a, a group of uh, uh, somebody and say, "Have you ever seen the glass eye before?" Peter used to do that as a kid. You see, Peter lost the eye when he was about three years old. I mean, he had he had a tumor. There was a tumor, and his mother, who who, who loved him dearly, he was devoted to his mother. But his mother didn't tell him. They just took him to the doctor, and the next thing you know, he knew they had taken the eye out. Um, but when he was he was Peter as a young man and as a as an adult was really a very good athlete. Uh, Peter was an excellent basketball player, great golfer. Uh, you know, he played Columbo. He was had sort of the, playing that schleppy role, you know. So, and 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 uh, Columbo was always easily winded. He always had the cigars. But in real life, Peter was a Peter was a very good athlete, and he was uh, tremendously good at a lot of sports. And as a young man, he played a lot of baseball, and. Uh, one time uh, he was uh, up at bat and uh, the umpire called a wide ball, a strike on him. Oh yeah. And he took the eye out and he put it on home plate and said, here, you need this more than I do. Yeah. I remember that one. Yeah. <laughs> and, and one thing I, I, I want to tell the listeners too, that rain jacket he wore yeah. was the same one he started Clumble with and ended with Clumble. That was his real, actually, Rain jacket. It, it, was his, it was his real raincoat. Yeah, yeah. I actually, I want to ask Peter because I, I just wanted. There to... was always the line that the raincoat was in the Smithsonian. You know, now there is a raincoat because there were there were more there was there were backup raincoats. There were stand-in raincoats. They donated one of those raincoats to Easter Seals one year or for charity. One of those went into the to the Smithsonian, but the actual raincoat <laughs> Peter kept. And that's the one he bought in New York on uh, 53rd Street or wherever. On a rainy day, he ducked in, he bought the raincoat, and it became Columbo's raincoat. 
And, uh, you know, when the show was nearing the end of its, its run, uh, I said to Peter at one point, uh, you know, everybody thinks the raincoat is in the Smithsonian. And he said, well, let me put it this way. If my closet upstairs at my house is the Smithsonian, that's where it is. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> so, so, I, I, so, you know, he, he held on to it. Great. Now, how can they find your books? Well, let's do that. Okay. Where can you well, find Amazon? Is, Amazon is a great place. I, I have a website, which is com. So it's very easy to, to find. It's just my name.com. And all of those the books have links to Amazon. So the reprint of the Columbo book is there. The Shawshank book is there. The Twilight Zone book is there. Uh, so several of the Mark Twain books are there. So um, anybody who is who, who goes looking, Amazon's a very good place to to for anybody to pick them up because you can pick them up anywhere in the world uh, where you are. And Columbo has a following all around the world. I, I hear from people in Australia, and Germany, and, and England, and Italy. You know, just it's it's amazing. It's not just a um, you know, this country, Colombo is one of our most popular exports as far as entertainment goes. You're right. So you know, the enduring appeal. I saw an a, a episode, God, years ago. Uh, I was at a friend's house and they could, they were Japanese. And, you know, they, they were just finishing watching Colombo when I went over there. It was on VHS. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at it and I'm going, that doesn't sound like Columbo. And then I, I, because they said they were watching Columbo. It was in Japanese, you know, dubbed. Mm -hmm. and, and I tell you, he is, didn't have the same impact in Japanese. No, but there are actors who are famous in their country for being the voice of Columbo in the country. They're the French actor is, I, 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 is, is a big star in France because he is the voice of Columbo in France when they dub it. Um, but, you know, he is iconic in Japan. As a matter of fact, my book has been translated. There are two, uh, been two editions in Japanese. Uh, that's how big, uh, you know, after the book had gone out of print here in the United States, it was still in print in Japan. <laughs> so uh, he is a very iconic figure there. Um, and rather, and, and, you know, Peter couldn't go anywhere and not be recognized as that character. Um, you know, he, he, he once told me the story that, he was shooting a movie uh, in South America. It's not a very good movie. It's called Vibes. It was with Jeff Goldblum and Cindy Lauper. And it's not a very good movie, but they were shooting up in these remote hills in South America. And from these huts emerged these natives yelling, Colombo! Colombo! <laughs> <laughs> oh. he's, he's in uh, uh, the Wim Wenders film, Winds of Desire. And uh, he plays this kind of angel-like figure. And um, he, 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 he's not quite sure who he is or what he is, but he, he's like supposed to be an angel. And they shot a lot of this, this stuff on the streets in Germany. And you can hear in the film, if you watch the film, When You Desire, you hear people in the background yelling, Columbo, Columbo. <laughs> so maybe, maybe, the, maybe Peter Falk is the angel. Maybe Columbo is the angel. I don't know. But he couldn't go anywhere uh, without being recognized in the world uh, as this character. And, I mean, that's how beloved this character is. And it hasn't and, dried uh, up. It's yeah, I mean, seriously, you you go on to your cable channel. I guarantee you can watch Columbo almost any hour of the day. Hey, Mark, I have to let you go. I want to thank you oh, so much. Oh, this has been fun. Been fun. You're yeah, a I mean, great guest. I want to also thank Ann Sterling for coming on the show. I appreciate, you know, you making that happen. You're a good friend. And you know what? Let's stay in touch. And, well, let's have fun again in a couple months. How's that? Sure. Sure. You know, you know, you know how shy and retiring I am. So, you know, I'm just going to have to work a little bit harder at getting me out of my shell. Oh, so, well, uh, we're working on that, my friend. Yeah, I know. I know. You're, it's, it's good therapy for me. <laughs> okay. You, you have a good one, okay? And stay out of trouble All this right. time. I hear what you've been doing okay, that yeah. night. Okay, my friend. You take care. <laughs> Take care. Uh-huh. Well, hey, James, I think it was a fantastic interview with our guests tonight, both of them. Oh, it always is, absolutely. Learned much stuff that we never knew before. Oh, yeah. I never realized that Rod Sterling would, you know, walk around imitating, uh, you know, 
a gorilla or watch the Flintstones and all these other cartoons. I mean, I, it would have been cool if my father would have done that. Yeah, I didn't know that either. That was, um, again, there was so much stuff that we learned. I, it was very fascinating. Oh, yeah. Well, we got some a couple of new books to talk about and a couple other things to talk about. Uh, why don't you mention some of the new books and where they can find it? Well, you can go to our website, and there's a section there that says Featured Books. You click on that, and one of the new books we got on there is called Earth, Astrology's Missing Planet. Uh, that's a very good book. It's a brand-new book we just put on there. Uh, what else we got? Oh, we got the Totally Ninja Raccoons Meet the Jersey Devil. Uh, that's a good book as well. And then we have the Totally Ninja Raccoons Meet the Little Green Men, and those two are by Kevin Coolidge. Uh, what else we got on there? We have uh, Inconvenient Facts, The Science That Al Gore Does Not Want You to Know, and that is by Gregory Wrightstone. I got to check that book out because I want to know what Al Gore doesn't want me to know about Earth Changes. I know. I, know, I keep thinking that myself. And uh, also another new book we got on there is called Contacts with the Gods from Space. And that's a brand new book on there you can check out. And that's from the many years of George, from George King. Oh, yeah. And Silent Invasion and the Ancient Alien Question. And don't forget the King. So you, if you want some good books, and if you're into the paranormal, you know, I tell you what, just go to our website. We got these people or have been or will be guests on our show. And, you know, uh, the best thing is you, you click on to it. You're not buying it from us. It's just a link. It takes you to Amazon where you can check out their book more or make the decision to purchase it. You need to do that. Now, another thing I want to say real quick, I want to say to one of our listeners who's a real good listener, Ed, I want to thank you for your service in Vietnam also. Uh, thank you for serving our country. A lot of people are forgetting about our Vietnam vets. And, you know, I, again, I just want to thank you for serving our country. It, it's, you know, I it's very important that it gets out. You know, who's our guest tomorrow? Well, tomorrow night we're going to have Jody Cook uh, on. He's going to be talking about dogmen and all the strangeness with that that's going on out there. And uh, that's going to be fascinating. And, well, then, since that is on Wednesday, how about Thursday and Friday? What's going on? Tell the people why they should be listening to us and not watching the boob tube. Well, I'm going to tell you something. You can listen to us and hear it straight from the horse's mouth because Mr. Jeffrey Cox is going to be on. And that's Thursday, and he's with um, MUFON. And he's also got one of his books on our website. And I'm going to tell you, it's a very good book. So you want to catch him and you can catch him live at seven o'clock Pacific time to hear what he's got to say. Now, also Friday, Friday, we've got two good guests coming on. We have two. Ones Wait first. a minute. Yeah. We got two great guests coming on this Friday. Yes. What are they? We first, before? No, 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 no. You're jumping a gun here. What no. are we going to be talking about with these two guests? Oh, boy. Let me tell you something. The first hour is going to be George Lunsford, and he's going to be talking about ghost stories and legends from around the country. Ooh. That's the first hour. Now, listen, the second hour, Varla Ventura is coming back, and she's going to talk about witchcraft. And this lady knows about witchcraft because, well, she's had some family members and lived through some stuff, and she gave us some tidbits. The last time she was on, left us hanging. Maybe this time we can get some answers. Now, why are the people watching TV and not listening to our show? That's not true. I just lied. You know, we had over 4 million hits last night with Dr. Richard Allen Miller talking about doomsday. Some people were upset. They, they said, I scared them. They couldn't sleep. Well, you know, again... I think some, you know, and one person said, well, you know, everybody knows that's just old, you know, news. Well, you know what? People are so into themselves night right now, more than ever. They got to think, I'm not trying to say the world's going to end tomorrow or a hundred years from now, but eventually it's going to, something is going to happen. I mean, I just read a news blurb while we were on the air 
uh, with Korea threatening a nuke us again uh, tonight. Uh, they're not going to do it, but they, you know, they make these threats all the time. I, 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 people need to be prepared, not just for that. Like I said last night, Texas almost lost their grid system, which would have took them over a year or more to get it up. Well, how are you going to pump oil in Texas? How are you going to go do anything in Texas if you have no electricity? I mean, if you're not prepared for a natural disaster, I mean, you're walking a tightrope with glass under you. And then you don't have to be 20 feet up. You could be five feet. You're going to fall. You're going to get hurt. People need to be prepared. That's all I was saying last night. And people need to have food, water to last a few weeks. And people need to think about that. People need to actually call up their mothers, call up their kids, call up their friends and say, hey, how are you doing? I miss talking to you. When can we see each other again? You know what? I love you. People aren't doing that. No, they're not. And it's unfortunate because the, the family structure is different now. Technology has ruined it. And then the separation and distancing, and it's just making people more cold and, and not together and helping each other. And, you know, Tony Dow was on the other night day, and he was talking about their refrigerator lasted 30 years. Their TVs would go 16 to 20 years before it would crap out. My new refrigerator is like four years old. It's not a cheap one. And I'm having pro it started having problems like yesterday or day before yesterday. And you know mm. what? They say technology is improved. No, we're in a throwaway world. Let's face it. Everything you buy, you go buy a cell phone, right? You pay anywhere from a hundred bucks for a cell phone to a couple thousand, depending on what features you have. But you know what? These cell phones are designed to only last. In other words, if you got a contract with whatever provider, right? And if you buy it on contract and it takes you two years to pay it off, the time or just the time you go to pay it off, guess what? You have to buy another freaking phone. Yeah, that's about all they're good for, really. And, and even if they do last past that, their technology within themselves becomes obsolete. Uh, I still have a stereo player from the 1960s. I had the eight track, the record player and ready all in one, Gary. I bet it like still works too. Thing. It does. It still works. Yeah. I, I can honestly tell you, I got stuff I bought six months ago. It doesn't work. It, 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 you know, again, let's face it. You know, you go out and buy a new car, right? You got a year warranty or whatever they put on them nowadays. Right. And soon as the warranty is out, your computer or something goes out, you figure, okay, because, you know, back 10, 15 years ago, they had small computer systems. Something went out as a little module. It cost a couple hundred bucks. If you got a new car and your computer, and in the case like this, my wife's car, right? The, the wipers would not work right, front and back. The lights would act up. Okay, and then it would start running rough and then it would act normal for a day or two. So we take it in the dealership figuring, hey, it's minor, right? $4,000 repair bill to replace the computer. Wow. Yeah, that's not too minor. That's that's minor if you're like a millionaire, maybe. But geesh, what do you do? I mean, you know, you're no warranty. You got to fix it. But, you know, when I got my first car, you could go out back then and buy a new car for like three thousand dollars. You could get yourself a Firebird. You could get yourself a Mustang. You could for a couple grand. Now you go out and pay what? You realize my very first house I bought, brand new, was fifteen thousand dollars. Fifteen thousand. You go buy a new house right now. You came and buy a bedroom for fifteen thousand dollars. We're in a disposable, deflated world. That's what we're in. Boy, that's true. You know, uh, I think they had light bulbs that would last forever back 100 years ago. But, you know, you, you, you can't make money that way. You got to make them last certain lengths so you keep buying them. But it's that principle. You're right. You got to keep coming back and buying new products. But you can't build something so good that you don't need it, need to replace it. Well, it's, everything's <laughs> like toilet paper, right? You use it once, it's over with. You go out and buy a new TV. 
Seriously. You go out and spend, well, of course, the prices have gone ridiculous right now, but you go out and buy a new TV. You're not buying it to last five, 10 years. You're buying it to last a year or two because not just because a new model is going to come out, they crap out. I mean, that's, and don't tell me that we can't make something that lasts 10, 20 years. They don't freaking want to. That's right. They can't. They'll put themselves out of business. It's all about the money. Unfortunately, instead of quality, you get semi quality, but you're not going to get good quality because think about it. If you build something that doesn't never break down, you, you put yourself out of business. No, I hate to say it. You know, I remember years ago, you would go to the department store and you go, I need a new iron. I need a new toaster, right? They were made in the United States and they lasted 20, 30 years. You go now, you, you try to find an iron or a toaster It's made in the United States. You know what? Our last company that made TVs, because of the trade tariffs, closed up. We don't even make a freaking TV in this country anymore. It's all offshore. But if you buy TV and it says made in the United States, one of these companies just got busted here like six months ago. And what they were doing is they would... Buy the TVs. They were all, you know, in a box. They were complete. But there was a little module that when it came to the distributor, right, they had to open it up and plug this module in. And then they claimed, well, it wasn't a working TV. It wasn't a TV to that module was plugged in. So they proudly said, proudly made in the United States. Oh, yeah. That I'll tell you, when's it going to end, Gary? Uh, is, is, there, is there a light at the end of the tunnel, or is it just going to keep going down this road? And then you were talking about the inflation thing. It's going to uh, compound things on top of that. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, no offense to our, our president and new administration, but, you know, it, it was in the news the other day again. And I don't want to get too political, but, you know, everybody's getting their, their money, right? Well, unless you're on Social Security, but you're getting your money. In fact, you might get yours in the next two weeks, uh, James. But here, here's the thing. Everybody's getting this money. So, you know, our president says we're going to tax the rich. Now, they, the, the Senate and the Congress has come back along with the administration saying, well, you know what? We're going to put a tax on, uh, increase on anybody that makes 80000 a year. Before, it was like you had to make 400000 before they were going to hit you with additional heavy taxes. Now they dropped it down to 80000 Now that is really scary. That is very scary. And it just seems like it just keeps piling up and piling up. And then you, well, I think you touched on it earlier today about people that, you know, that own property and, and rent things out. They're really in a, in a backed in a corner. Oh, yeah. There was an article, like I was telling you before we went on the air, locally, a guy, you know, rented out a house. Now, it, it, it have to, granted, where I'm at, they're not cheap houses. So he was renting this house out for $4,000 a month. And that his mortgage payment, the guy renting it, was $3,800 a month. He got a tenant in almost a year ago and made the down, you know, the the deposit paid the one month's rent and said i'll pay the other you know month's rent because they want first and last in a week the guy never received anything more he can't evict him and the situation where he's in he has a mortgage on that house of 3800 a month he has a mortgage on his other house he thought this was going to be able to help support him when he retires because he could flip the house, you know, in a couple of years, make a big profit. Now the guy's in foreclosure. So, you know, it, what's happening, he's going to lose his house over it because he, you know, didn't have the money to keep making double mortgage payments on his house and that other house. And they can't evict the other person out right now, even in foreclosure. So, the guy and the guy, what I heard in the article, him and his wife work and he makes a good salary. He just decided, well, do you know what? I don't have to pay my rent. So, you know, I can see there's a lot of people out there who don't have the money and they can't afford to pay their rent. 
And I understand that. But some people, I hate to say it, they take advantage of the situation. Oh, big time. Uh, and that's too bad. And a lot of people know that of the state laws and what they can get away with. Like some states, you stay overnight in one house, they can, you know, a landlord can spend three months and hundreds of thousands of dollars getting you evicted. It's crazy. Some of these laws. Well, and you better not leave. You, you better not invite me to spend the weekend because if I decided I could just, Hey, I'm going to just live with you and I'm not going to pay you any money. And you, you know what? You call up your local police, right? And say, Hey, this guy won't leave. They say, take him to court. Well, you know what? The courts are backed up now, like never before. So if you try to evict somebody in court, you can take almost a year to get a court case tried. You know, uh, uh, one of these uh, big, huge cities or state, uh, it was an article yesterday. They're not going after people for drug charges anymore. They're not going after prostitution anymore. If you go out and do, you know, bad check writing, they're not going to arrest you because you know what? They don't have the money to prosecute you now. They don't have the room to put you in prison. And they realize it could take a couple of years to get you into the court. That's how things are screwed up. By the way, also, this article about, you know, Mars could support in communities like a million people. Somebody is smoking something. One, as we know, there's virtually no oxygen on uh, uh, Mars. Water comes and goes, depending on the cycles. The same with oxygen levels. It, you could get hit with the, uh, with meteorites just walking around on Mars because there's virtually no protection uh, about them burning up before it hits. And now, how could you, what are you going to, and they even went in so far I went so far as reading an article, even growing uh, vegetables and, and stuff like that on Mars, because of the lack of oxygen, because of the, the certain other elements, okay, uh, the solar radiation and stuff like that, plants will only survive so long. In other words, you grow something, the next time you grow it, it's not going to, you know, after a couple cycles, it's over with. So how in the blankety blank could you support a million people on Mars? And how are you going to supply food for them? Water. It, 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 people are dreaming. I'll tell you about this Mars thing. Oh, big time. I don't even think we have the technology to even go to the moon nowadays. I'll, t I'll tell you. And they were talking 2024. Then they were talking a, women, a woman's crew. I don't think we can even get there now. You know, take dip your toes in the pond first before you just jump in, you know, going to Mars, like you say, a one-way trip. Well, you know, I, I wouldn't want to, I'm not going to say it because I don't want to get sued, but this one person that is developing these rocket ships, right? They go up really nice, but they sure don't land right. Would you want to, I don't know how long it would take to get to Mars, but seriously, on your tri way to trip to Mars, you, besides your testicles shrinking, your brain's going to be shrinking. Your heart's going to be shrinking. You're going to have maybe plug arteries, all this stuff going on because we're not meant to be in space. And we don't have that technology yet to create something where they could. So by the time these people, they could start out at 25 years old, right? Physically. I'm not talking about you know, actual life. They're 25 years old. But by the time they get to Mars, they're going to be an 80, 90-year-old physically. They might look they're 25 years old, but physically, they're going to be, their joints, everything is going to be equal to somebody's belongs in the nursing home. So how are they going to survive on Mars? They're not. Every time, as soon as you leave this orbit, your body instantly starts breaking down. I mean, it's been proven. Every astronaut's been up there. As soon as they come down, they're breaking down. And imagine being up in space six months to a year, two-year round trip or one-way trip or whatever. Mm. I don't know. Well, you know what? Maybe they should go to the pre uh, prison system and say, hey, who wants a free trip to Mars? It's no worse than what they do to them, you know, people on death row. I wouldn't want to go there. I don't have no, dis unless, unless, again, NASA saying 100 years from now, unless we can figure out how to deflect it, 
the doomsday asteroid will hit Earth. So maybe they're figuring, you know, for a backup plan, maybe we should get off this little, you know, plantation and go somewhere. I don't know. Again, I want to thank Mark and Sterling and James, my producer. Without him, we wouldn't be on the air to the radio stations that carry us and all you guys out there who listen to me make a fool out of myself every night. I want to thank you so much for tuning in. But I do have a favor for you. Share us with our your friends. Tell them, hey, if you want to listen to something without heavy metal, all hyped up, if you know what I mean, uh, to tune in to our show. And, you know, I we're trying a little bit something different. Besides doing the paranormal, what we, we normally do, we're bringing in, like, Ann Sterling tonight and Mark. You know, Tony Dow, Walter, you know, Chekhov, uh, you know, Kevin Kennedy, uh, you know, um, Mark Cushman, all these people out there in the entertainment field. And, you know, for their stories. And we're trying to, you know, make the show more interesting. So, you know, I appreciate all of you guys who listen. And again, to like Ed and everybody out there who has served our country. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you. And uh, we'll catch you tomorrow. So everybody have a good one. And again, James, you stay out of trouble. And uh, again, check out our website. I updated it a little bit today at www.nightdreamstalkradio.com. Everybody, you have a good one. You and I